على قبيبك خير الخلق كلهم مولاي صلي وسلم دائما ابدا على حبيبك خير الخلق كلهم Quran is the only scripture on the face of earth which actually mentions marry only once. One of the most common question asked by our non-Muslim brethren, if you allow a man to have more than one wife, then why don't you allow a woman to have more than one husband? Where a man has more than one wife, it is very easy to identify the parents of the child. But in case of polyandry, identification of the father of the child becomes very difficult. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Praise be to Allah, Lord of the Worlds. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Brother Ashraf Muhammadi, Dr. Zakir Naik, respected guests, brothers and sisters. Assalamu alaikum. May peace be on you. I, Dr. Muhammad Naik, am your host and coordinator for today's program. On behalf of the Islamic Research Foundation, I welcome all of you to this morning's talk on Misconceptions About Islam by Brother Ashraf Muhammadi. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-kareem wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een. Amma ba'd. A'uzu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil-hikmah wal ma'u'izati al-hasana wa jadilhum billati hiya ahsan. Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi shrah li sadri وَيَسِّرْ لِي عَمْرِي وَحْلُ الْأُقْدَةَ مِّنْ لِسَانِي يَفْقَهُ قَوْلِي Dr. Muhammad Naik, Dr. Zakir Naik, respected elders, and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greeting, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace, blessings, and mercy of Allah be on all of you. The topic for today's talk is misconceptions about Islam. There are various methodologies of conveying the message of Islam. Some methods may be better than the other. And Allah says in the Holy Quran, the verse I recited initially, in the initial portion of the talk, where he says, Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah wal ma'izatil hasana wa jadil hum billati hiya ahsan. Allah says in Surah Nahl, chapter 16, verse 125, Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah wal ma'izatil hasana. Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching. Wajadil hum billati hiya ahsan. And argue with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. On the basis of this verse of the Holy Quran, we at the Islamic Research Foundation prefer to make the non-Muslim brother and sister pose a question first and see to it that we try and remove the misconception before giving the positive aspects of Islam. Islam comes from the root word salam, which means peace. Islam also means submitting your will to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty. So in other words, Islam means attaining peace by submitting your will to the will of God Almighty. In the Islamic Sharia, the do's and don'ts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instructed us to follow, all of the do's and don'ts 
are on the basis of reason, logic, and modern scientific knowledge. All the answers to these questions can conveniently answer the reasoning of a human being. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone knows the ultimate reasons. In his infinite wisdom, he alone knows the reasons behind all these do's and don'ts. One of the most common questions asked by our non-Muslim brethren is that why do you Muslims, you have four wives? Why do you marry four women? In other words, they say, why do you follow polygamy? Polygamy means a person having more than one spouse. Polygyny means a man having more than one wife. And polyandry means a woman having more than one husband. Islam strictly prohibits polyandry, but allows polygyny. The Quran is the only scripture on the face of earth which actually mentions marry only one. No other religious scriptures of the world made with the Vedas, the Ramayana, the Bhagavad Gita, or the Bible, none of them put a restriction on the number of marriages. It is only later on than the priests and the church, they put a restriction on the number of marriages. If we analyze the Hindu scriptures, we find that various Hindu religious personalities had several wives. In Christianity as well, we come to know, according to the Bible, that polygyny was allowed. It was only later on that the church put a restriction to it. Even in Judaism, according to the Talmudic law, we know that Abraham had three wives. Solomon had several wives. Later on, that Rabbi Jerusham bin Yehuda, in the 10th century, he passed an edict restricting the Jews to marry only one. In spite of this, right up to 1950, the Shephardic communities living in the Islamic countries, the Muslim countries, they used to practice polygyny. Later on, the chief rabbinate of Israel put an act, passed an act whereby forbidding them and restricting them to one marriage. According to the Committee of Status of Women in Islam, published in 1975, on page number 66 and 67, it compares the percentage of polygamous marriages in India. And for the year 1951 to 1961, they have given the percentage of the Hindu community, polygamous marriages in the Hindu community, at 5.06%. And that, amongst the Muslims, was 4.31%. It is illegal in India for any non-Muslim to have more than one wife. But in spite of this, we find, according to the report, that the Muslims have a lesser percentage of polygamous marriages. Let us analyze the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permits polygyny in Islam. As I said in the beginning of this answer, that Quran is the only scripture on the face of earth which actually mentions marry only one. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 3, where he says, marry women of your choice in twos, threes, or fours. But if you fear that you will not be able to deal with them justly, then marry only one. Allah says that if you cannot deal amongst your wives justly, then marry only one. So the condition placed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that you should be able to deal justly amongst your wives. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 129, where he says that you cannot deal justly amongst your wives, however much is your ardent desire. So we find that polygyny is not a rule, but is an exception to the rule. In the do's and don'ts in Islam, according to the Islamic Sharia, there are five broad categories of the do's and don'ts. The first is the fard. That is compulsory. Second, mustahab. That is encouraged or recommended. The third is mubah. That is permissible or allowed. The fourth category is that of makru. That is not recommended or discouraged. And the fifth category is that of haram. That is prohibited. Polygyny 
falls in the third category of mubah, that is permissible or allowed. A Muslim who has more than one wife is in no way a better Muslim than the one who has just one wife. My name is Shakiri. My name is Naseem Abdul Rahman. My name is Faraj Wahaj. My name is Musa Bena. I was a Christian. Hindu. I had a Christian upbringing. When I asked 10 people about Hinduism, I used to get 10 different answers. My heart was attracted to Islam. I oh, yeah, used to ask a lot of questions to the priests and I wasn't getting the answers. Why did I become a Muslim? Allah knows best. Alhamdulillah, I've made the right choice. My choice tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 7.30 p.m. UAE on Peace TV. Dialogue. Discussion, 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 debate, 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 rebuttal, rebuttal, rebuttal conclusion. conclusion. Eliminate misconceptions about religion. Get enlightened. Witness Dr. Zakir Naik in a battle of words in Crossfire tomorrow at 8.30 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 9.30 p.m. UAE on Peace TV. Islam is a religion of purity. Not only physical purity, but purity of the spirit as well. Islam commands us to cleanse our hearts from hatred, enmity, envy, and cowardice. It instructs us to be caring, loving, generous, brave, and forgiving. Let's join hands in improving the moral conduct of humanity through Islam. Join me in Akhlaq only on Peace TV. It's most emphasized in Islam after faith and worship. Join Asim Al Hakim in Akhlaq next on Peace TV. Let us analyze the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the permission to have more than one wife. If we analyze, doctors, they tell us that in the pediatric stage itself, the female child has higher immunity as compared to the male child. The female child has greater resistance to diseases and germs as compared to the male child. And in the pediatric stage itself, the ratio of the female child is higher than that of the male child. There are more females in the world right from the pediatric stage itself, although males and females more or less are born in the same proportion. Later on, due to accidents, wars, diseases, the male is more prone to death as compared to the female. No wonder in the world we have more widows than widowers. The only exception in this ratio is countries like India, where the male population is higher than the female population. And this is because of the concept of female infanticide. As soon as, as soon as the fetus or the child is identified as a female child, she is aborted. It is because of this reason that the male population in India is higher than the female population. Every year, more than a million fetuses are aborted in India on being identified as being females. If this evil practice is stopped in India, even in India, the female population would be higher than the male population. In USA alone, there are 7.8 million more females than male. In New York alone, there are a million more females as compared to males. And one third of the population of New York are gays, sodomites, Kormeluth, people who do not wish to have partners. In Great Britain alone, there are four million more females than males. In Germany alone, there are five million more females than males. In Russia alone, there are nine million more females than males. God alone knows how many more females there are in the world as compared to males.
if all the men in USA are married, if all of them are married and the market is saturated, in that case, there would be more than 30 million females in USA who would not be able to find husbands. And this is because there are more than 25 million gays in USA alone. So there would be 30 million females who would not be able to find husbands. If my sister, or suppose your sister, happens to be one of those unfortunate ladies in USA who is not able to find a husband, she has just two options. First, either she marries a man who is already married, or she becomes public property. People say, how can you use such a harsh word, public property? But this is the softest word that we can use. It is very common in US for people to have mistresses and multiple extramarital affairs. This is acceptable over there, and this leads to the woman living an undignified and an unprotected life. But this is not permissible in Islam. In Islam, the US does not accept a man having more than one wife and he giving her a dignified and a protected life. So in the case of US, if a woman has the option, either she can marry a person who is already married or she becomes public property. Islam disallows the second option and prefers the first option of her marrying a person who's already married. In this way, Islam gives dignity and protection to the women. Another question that non-Muslims have is that if you Muslims allow polygyny, if you allow a man to have more than one wife, then why don't you allow a woman to have more than one husband? And this is one question which is quite common and which has confused Muslims as well as non-Muslims. Let me be very clear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created male as well as female as equal. But he has given different responsibilities to them. Men have a different set of responsibilities as compared to women who have a different set of responsibilities. Similarly, we are psychologically as well as physiologically different. Women and men, although are given equality, they are not identical. Coming to the question of polyandry, we know that in case of polygyny, where a man has more than one wife, it is very easy to identify the parents of the child. But in case of polyandry, identification of the father of the child becomes very difficult. In Islam, it is very important that the child is able to identify both the father as well as the mother. Psychologists tell us that if a child is not able to identify his parents, then he has a troubled childhood. And that is precisely the reason why children of prostitutes have a very unhealthy childhood. Moreover, at the time of admission in the school, the mother would have an embarrassing situation of giving more than one name of the father of the child. I know due to modern technological advances, Today, it is possible, due to genetic tests, etc., to identify father as well as the mother. And that is why this point was valid in the past and may not be valid now. But Islam is not only for now, it is for past thousands of years. Moreover, we know that man is more polygamous than, by nature as compared to woman. As I said, a man has got different set of responsibilities. And because of this, it is possible for a man to carry out his duties and responsibilities as a husband in case of a polygynous marriage. But it is very difficult for a woman to carry out her duties and responsibilities in a situation of polyandry. Again, doctors, they tell us that if a woman has more than one husband and none of them have an extramarital affair, even in spite of this, there are very high chances of the women acquiring sexually transmitted diseases or venereal diseases. In case of polygyny, 
where a man has more than one wife, the chances of this are very less. These are a few reasons why polyandry has been prohibited in Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone knows what are the other reasons why this has been prohibited. Another misconception amongst the non-Muslim brothers and sisters is that why do you Muslims degrade women by putting her in the hijab, the Islamic dress code? Before going into this question, let's analyze the status of women in the past civilizations. In the Babylonian civilization, the woman was degraded to such an extent that if a man kills a woman, it is not the man but his wife who was given the punishment. In the Greek civilization, a civilization which is considered to be the most glorious of all the ancient civilizations, the woman was again considered to be subhuman and inferior. According to the Greek mythology, there was an imaginary woman called Pandora. And Pandora was considered to be the root cause of all the problems of humankind, all the misfortunes of human beings. Again, in the Roman civilization, the man had the right to kill his wife. In the Egyptian civilization as well, women were considered to be evil. In the pre-Islamic Arabia, before Islam spread to the Arabian countries, over there it was very common for people to bury the girl, female child alive as soon as she was born. In the backdrop of all this, Islam came 1,400 years ago and it brought about a code giving dignity and honor to the status of woman. Coming back to the question of hijab, before addressing women on the issue of hijab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty addresses us men as far as hijab is concerned. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran in Surah Nur chapter 24 verse 30, where he says, and say to the believing men to lower the gaze and guard their modesty, for this will be pure for them. And after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the next verse, in Surah Nur, chapter 24, verse 31, where he says, and say to the believing women to lower their gaze and guard their modesty. And Allah continues by saying that to cover herself completely and draw the veil over the bosoms. And she should not display her adornments except what can be ordinarily seen. And except in front of her husband, her father, and a long list of mehrams whom she could not marry. So we find, according to the Holy Quran, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs us men to follow the hijab first, and then comes the instructions for the women. There are six criteria for hijab, for the Islamic dress code. And out of the six, except for the first criteria, all the other five are common. The first criteria is that of the extent. The extent of hijab for the male is that of the navel to the knee. And the extent of hijab for the women is that she covers herself completely except what can be ordinarily seen. A few Islamic scholars are of the opinion that even the face should be covered but most of the scholars disagree with this, and they say that the face as well as the hands up to the wrist can be seen. Besides this, the other criteria are that the clothes that we wear should not be tight so as to reveal the figure. The clothes that we wear should not be transparent, should not be see-through so that the figure can be seen. The clothes that we wear should not be glamorous so as to attract the attention of the opposite sex. The clothes that we wear should not resemble those of the opposite sex. And the clothes that we wear should not resemble those of the unbelievers, like putting on a cross, putting vermil on, etc. So these are the criteria of hijab as far as clothes are concerned. But more than this, the hijab also constitutes the thought. That is hijab of the thought, hijab of the eyes, hijab of the tongue, hijab of the heart, 
all this has to be followed by the Muslim. It includes the way we talk, the way we walk, the way we conduct ourselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again says in the Holy Quran, in Surah Ahzab, chapter 33, verse 59, where he says that, O Prophet, say to your daughters and your wives and the believing women that they should put on their outer garment whenever they go out. This is so that can be recognized as such and that they are not molested. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you have to put on the outer garment so that you can be recognized as modest women and that you are saved from rape and molestation. For example, if there are two twin sisters who are equally identical and equally good looking and they are walking down a street. At the corner, there is a hooligan waiting for a catch, waiting to tease someone. One of the sister is putting on the Islamic hijab that is covering herself completely, except for the face and the hands up to the wrist. And the other sister is dressed in mini skirts. Who is the hooligan going to tease? The sister in the hijab or the one in the mini skirt? Of course, he will tease the sister in the miniskirt. to ask you about the life of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, about the incidents that occurred before his prophethood and in Mecca and in Medina, about the names of his loved ones and his wives and his children, how much would we be able to know? How many incidents have we memorized? Brothers and sisters, isn't it more important that we study the seerah of the most important human being who ever walked the face of this earth? Join me, your host Yasser Qadli, as we discuss the most important biography of the most illustrious human being that ever lived, the seerah of our beloved Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Join Yasir Qadi in Seerah of the Prophet, peace be upon him, tomorrow at 6 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 7 p.m. UAE on Peace TV. A friendly message by Dr. Zakir. The most profitable business. Would you like to know the business in which you earn the maximum profit? The secret is given in the glorious Quran. In Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 261. The example of those who spend their wealth in the way of Allah is like a seed of grain, which grows seven spikes. In each spike is a hundred grains. And Allah multiplies his reward to whom he wills. If you spend your wealth in the way of Allah, you'll get a return of 700 times. In business terminology, you'll get a profit of 70,000%. Is there any business you know of in which you'll get a better return? Invest today in the way of Allah. Peace TV, the solution for humanity.